Sometimes, despite our best efforts, patients continue to decompensate. We struggle to work against the clock to get our patients resuscitated and turned around, but this does not always work out the way we would hope. As experts in resuscitation, we are called upon to know what to do in the worst case scenario. We need to know how to intervene and what to do even when all seems lost. Families and loved ones will look to you in their most dire hours, and that is why basic life support is so vitally important as a part of the first responder skill set. Even when the worst happens and our patients lose their pulse, we still know what to do. So let's talk about BLS. Basic life support is arguably the most important set of skills you need to have mastered as an EMT or paramedic. The advanced skills involved in your expertise mean nothing if you can't perform good quality CPR. Only two things have ever been proven time and again to make any real difference in survival when it comes to a patient's in cardiac arrest. Good quality chest compressions and early defibrillation. I might be able to intubate someone upside down and backwards, but if I can't perform good quality CPR and know how to operate an AED or defibrillator, what's the point? When would you ever intubate someone upside down and backwards in the ER? Well, like, you know my life. In this scenario, we're either responding to a patient who is pulseless, or while attempting to stabilize a patient, they lose their pulse. Before we start CPR, we want to make sure that the scene is safe and we put on our appropriate personal protective equipment. Two victims are worse than one, so we want to make sure to protect ourselves so that we don't become a victim as well. Next, we want to establish whether or not our patient has a pulse by checking for a carotid pulse for no more than 10 seconds. We look for a carotid pulse since the carotid pulse is closest to the heart and it will be the last pulse to disappear as the patients decompensate. We then want to begin good quality chest compressions. Good quality chest compressions involve three components. One, appropriate rate, two, appropriate depth, and three, full chest recoil. Chest compressions should be at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. This has been shown to be an appropriate rate to build up enough pressure in the circulatory system to perfuse the heart. The depth of compressions should be two inches or about a third of the chest wall. We're using the rib cage to squeeze the heart and so appropriate compression depth is important as too little depth won't adequately compress the heart. Full chest recoil is very important because of when the heart itself gets its own blood supply. Remember, the coronary arteries supply blood to the heart muscle. In order for a heart to start beating again, it has to have enough blood flow to its tissue. This is the whole point of CPR, providing adequate blood flow to the heart itself so that it can begin beating again. Coronary perfusion pressure is what we're trying to maintain during CPR. When the heart is contracting, the coronary arteries are squeezed and blood does not flow through them. It is when the heart relaxes that the coronary arteries are able to relax and deliver blood to the heart tissue. So during systole, the heart pumps blood to the system, and during diastole, it receives its own blood supply. This is why allowing for full chest recoil during CPR is so important. It allows the heart to fully relax and thus receive blood from the coronary arteries. We said that other than good chest compressions, the only other thing that has been shown to save lives during cardiac arrest is early defibrillation. In basic life support, we rely on the AED to let us know whether a patient needs to be defibrillated or not. In advanced cardiac life support, we interpret the rhythm ourselves in order to determine whether or not it's shockable. Understanding the underlying role of the defibrillator and what we're doing during defibrillation is important regardless. During defibrillation, we are administering an electrical current to the heart in order to stop the heart so that its own intrinsic conduction pathway, starting with the SA node, can begin firing again, which we hope will get the heart to start beating again. We're not jump starting the heart, but rather stopping the heart completely so that the cardiac conduction system can take back over.